Not surprisingly, therefore, the defence of the Holy Land depended heavily on castles and town walls. Castles were established especially along the frontiers, like that of Belvoir, overlooking the valley of the River Jordan, held by the Knights Hospitaller. And to muster this army in the field, to fight a campaign of open warfare, the garrisons of castles and towns had to be stripped to the bone, leaving only the old and the sick behind. Thus, to fight a pitched battle was a potentially very risky strategy. The Franks were well aware of their weakness. Indeed, they had been since Zengi's capture of Edessa in 1144 and the failure of the subsequent Second Crusade to capture Damascus in 1148. From about 1150 onwards, there were regular appeals for help to the West from the Crusader states. It has been calculated that there was on average one appeal for aid every five years between 1150 and 1187. If anything, these appeals to the Pope for onward transmission to Western rulers or directly to these rulers themselves, especially the kings of France and England, grew more frequent and more urgent as the perceived Muslim threat increased. But they had little or no effect. Western Europe was beset with internal political disputes between the Pope and the German Emperor and between the kings of France and England over the lands that the latter ruled within France. The rulers of the West might pay lip service to the need to assist the Holy Land, but in practice they were too preoccupied with their own affairs actually to provide such help. Henry II of England, king from 1154 to 89, is a classic example. After the murder of Archbishop Thomas Becket of Canterbury, Henry, whom the church held responsible for the archbishop's death, had promised in 1172 to go on crusade. He had indeed sent substantial sums of money out to Jerusalem to be kept in trust for him to pay the expenses of his future crusade when he should make it. But by 1187, he still had not actually gone. And the Franks of the East clearly felt that he was never really going to come to their assistance. Indeed, in 1185, when the Patriarch of Jerusalem, the senior churchman of the Crusader States, had visited the West seeking help, he commented bluntly on Henry II's failure to fulfil his promise to depart on crusade and on the unhelpful nature of sending money whose use was embargoed until the king should, in theory, appear. We want, he said, a prince who needs money, not money that needs a prince. In addition, up until 1180, the Crusader states had benefited from an alliance with the Byzantine Empire the major Christian power in the East before the Crusades, which still ruled over the Balkans and Western Asia Minor. The Byzantine Emperor Manuel Comnenus had furnished the Franks of the East with considerable financial subsidies, and the threat of Byzantine military assistance had helped to defend the northern Crusader states from Zengi and nur din Despite overwhelming military superiority, nur din had never actually attacked, directly attacked Antioch. It was not the small forces available to the Prince of Antioch that had deterred him. It was the threat of a Byzantine army. But in 1176, Manuel Comnenus had suffered a major defeat at the hands of the Turks of Asia Minor at the Battle of Myriocephalon. After this, Byzantine military power diminished. And after Manuel's death in 1180, the Byzantine Empire had become increasingly embroiled in internal political dispute. Furthermore, the alliance with the Westerners had never been very popular, and the emperors after 1180 had no interest in continuing it. Indeed, they pursued an actively anti-Western policy, to such an extent that Isaac Angelos, emperor from 1185 onwards, actually concluded an alliance with Saladin. It was clear, therefore, that after 1180, the Franks of the East could expect no further help from the Byzantines. Hence, by the 1180s, the Islamic world was becoming increasingly united and there was little or no prospect of the Crusader states receiving outside assistance. 
It was, in fact, only the profound psychological shock of the fall of Jerusalem in 1187 that led the West to put aside its internal problems and bring significant military aid to what little was then left of the Crusader states. This might not have mattered so much had the Crusader states been militarily strong, but they were not. The underlying demographic weakness of the Franks a minority within their own states, meant that the Crusader states were therefore very vulnerable to a sustained external attack. And although Saladin devoted much of his attention between 1174 and 1185 to the unification of the Islamic Middle East, it was very much in his interest to use the call for jihad, holy war against the infidel, as a rallying cry to secure that unity. And from 1177 onwards, he had combined attacks launched against the frontiers of the Kingdom of Jerusalem with his campaigns against rival Muslim leaders. As essentially a usurper who had displaced the sons and other relatives of Nur ad-Din, uniting Islam against the unbelievers gave his political predominance a legitimacy that it did not otherwise possess. All of this presented a serious enough threat to the continued survival of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. But it was made worse when the Franks quarrelled among themselves. In the years after 1174, the Kingdom of Jerusalem lost the internal political cohesion that it had previously, most of the time, possessed. The reasons for this are complex, and historians are not entirely agreed as to what these were. But the trigger for these disputes was the royal succession. King Amalric of Jerusalem had died in 1174 at the age of 38. He had left a son and daughter by his first marriage and a very young daughter by his second. But not only was this son, who became king as Baldwin IV, only 13 when his father died, he was also a leper. This meant that he could never marry or have children, and while at first he was able still to play an active role, his disease had a progressively disabling effect, which meant that by the time he died in 1185 at the age of 24, and indeed for some years earlier, he was bedridden and unable effectively to rule in person. This in turn meant that others had to rule for him as lieutenants of the kingdom, and the question as to who was to succeed him became increasingly fraught. Dispute began almost immediately on Amalric's death. It was because of their internal quarrels that the Franks failed to prevent, or even to try to prevent, Saladin's capture of Damascus, six months after the death of Amalric. But the tensions grew worse after 1180, when the king's eldest sister, Sibylla, married an immigrant from Poitou called Guy de Lusignan. Guy became, by right of his marriage, potentially the heir to the kingdom. Matters reached a first crisis when Saladin launched an invasion of the kingdom in 1183. Guise, the king's lieutenant, mustered an army, reinforced by various visiting pilgrims, and for several weeks in September 1183, this force stood on the defensive near Nazareth in Galilee, watching Saladin's army. Early in October, Saladin and his forces retreated home. One might perhaps have expected that Guy would be praised for saving the kingdom and without fighting a risky pitch battle into the bargain. In fact, he came under sustained criticism from some of the other barons of the kingdom. William of Tyre, who sympathised with them, accused Guy of cowardice as well as incompetence because he had not fought a battle. The king appeared to agree with these sentiments, for he dismissed Guy and appointed another lieutenant Count Raymond III of Tripoli, the king's cousin. Raymond, as Count of Tripoli, was ruler of an independent state, but through his marriage, he had also become Prince of Galilee, holder of one of the most important baronies within the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Subsequent dispute coalesced behind Guy on one side and Raymond as party leader on the other. To what extent two clear groups or parties that emerged within the nobility and leading churchmen of the Kingdom of Jerusalem is open to question. 
there may only have been relatively fluid factions with some shifting of loyalties. Guy and some of his allies may well have been disliked as incomers by those whose families have been in the East for several generations. But whatever the causes, dispute and tension there clearly was. These tensions came to a head in 1186, 